Yes, this is the Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund to be found at the website by that name with hyphens dot net. And we will continue with the reading and commentaries on Les Fisher's study and book entitled The Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State during the 19th century, the Second International, and all of that. Okay. Let's go for it. Starting again on page 175 here. And we're in the last chapter. And it says, The year 1894 also saw the publication of Engels's edition of the third volume of Das Kapital that, quote, questioned a number of conclusions that we pupils of Marx had drawn from the first volume, unquote. Especially its first chapter, quote, made an almost tragic impression on me, unquote. Clearly, then, if we are looking for, quote, early harbingers of the revisionist controversy, unquote, we hardly need turn to matters Jewish. This does not rule out that they may have been among the concerns that reinforced his doubts. If so, he may have had his reasons for not mentioning this in his later account. It doesn't make it rather unlikely, though, that it was these particular Jewish, quote-unquote, concerns that, quote, first led him to reassess an orthodox Marxist position. Jacob's notions regarding Bernstein's development are, in any case, rather tentative. Subtle expressions of a shift in emphasis as early as 1898, notwithstanding, Jacobs ultimately concludes that Bernstein, quote, did not decisively break from his earlier positions, unquote, prior to 1914. The decisive shift only occurred, quote, from approximately midway through World War I to the end of his life. And it was, above all, the rise of anti-Semitism that preceded it, or that precipitated it. For, as Jacob points out, quote, Bernstein repeatedly, and with notable prescience, insisted that the anti-Semitic movement of the 1920s was quite different from earlier anti-Jewish movements, unquote. Bernstein's recognition that the political anti-Semitism of the post-war period posed a threat of an entirely different intensity and order of magnitude was indeed prescient. On the other hand, his insistence on the fact that this latter anti-Semitism was a very different phenomena also allowed him to take it more seriously without having to question his earlier approach in any way that might have caused him genuine discomfort. How perceptions of antisemitism changed in the Weimar period is one of the issues I will be discussing in my next book. We need not discuss it in detail, though, to acknowledge that we surely need to keep in mind the following. The fact that quite a few people increasingly did begin to take the political antisemitism that emerged from the second half of the war onwards more seriously does not automatically make their response to it more adequate, precisely because this new antisemitism really did have more vicious and far more dangerous quality to it. The crucial question is therefore just how much more seriously people were prepared to take it. In other words, was the gap between their heightened awareness and the more aggressive forms of post-war anti-Semitism really any smaller than the previous gap between their great indifference and the less aggressive manifestations of pre-war political anti-Semitism? Okay, let's continue now with the reading of Les Fischer's <clears throat> Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State. <clears throat> 
And here we go. There it is. Got it, as the Br British would say. And we must speak British here in Canada. Okay. Clearly, then, Bernstein owes his reputation as a socialist of unusual sensitivity for the implications of anti-Semitism and the Jewish question, predominantly to his post-war career. It seems highly unlikely that we would be giving the nuances of his stance in the pre-war period a second thought were it not for our knowledge of his post-war track record. Had Bernstein died in 1915, we would still remember him as the father of revisionism. Yet we would hardly be considering the possibilities that certain aspects of his position on anti-Semitism and the Jewish question in the 19, 1890s might have been early harbingers of the revisionist controversy. Oh. That does not make this line of inquiry illegitimate or implausible, of course, but it does alert us to the possibility that Bernstein's peers and contemporaries in Imperial Germany lacking our hindsight, may have found it rather more difficult to perceive of Bernstein as being substantially at odds with the relevant discourse within the party. Consequently, the juxtaposition of Bernstein and Mehring as singularly sensitive to matters Jewish and singularly lacking in that sensitivity, respectively, might well have struck them as rather less compelling than it had seemed to the bulk of the more recent scholarship on the matter. Yes, leave the hindsight. Okay. One of my lead questions throughout this book has been this. It says Lars Fischer. Assuming somebody socialized in Imperial Germany who had imbibed its prevalent preconceptions regarding the Jews had become interested in social democracy, to what extent and in what ways, if any, would the encounter with socialism most likely have challenged his or her perceptions? Applied to this particular context, we need to put the question as follows. Would such an individual have incurred, encountered Bernstein's stance as challenging the notions accepted in the party at large and in society more generally? Question. Conversely, I suggested at the outset that we can gauge the virulence of prevalent perceptions regarding the Jews in Imperial German society as a whole, precisely by examining their impact in one of the arenas in which we would least expect them to take hold, namely in social democratic discourse and by social democrats who are Jewish to boot. In keeping with this approach, the extent to which Bernstein continued to perpetuate many of the stereotypes prevalent among his peers and contemporaries, even when his emphasis really did begin to shift, is similarly telling and indicative of the widespread acceptance on which these stereotypes could draw and count. Okay. Okay. So that means you're all guilty. Yeah. Finally, we need to consider one other aspect that emerges rather strikingly from Jacob's discussion of Bernstein. And this, in fact, applies to his account of Kautsky, too. Many of the most potent expressions of his change in emphasis were made not, or at least not in the first instance, within Germany or in the context of the German party, but abroad or in an international context. This obviously attenuated their likely effect on his German comrades, peers, and contemporaries. Yet further. Now, it is by no means my intention to deny the existence of a connection 
between a revisionist cause and a more flexible approach to the Jewish question. The nexus is rather obvious and ultimately quite banal. As George Moss put it rather aptly in his assessment of the Weimar years, the shift in emphasis was, quote, part of a more general revisionism, which tended toward, towards gradualism, while those who moved further to the left put their faith in revolution and in the idea of the new man, unquote. To a considerable degree, this was effectively a conceptual zero-sum game. As we saw, the initial Marxian vision assumed that revolution would eventually spell a radical new beginning for Jews and non-Jews alike. Admittedly, Jewry as distinct entity would cease to exist in the process. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, just like the state was supposed to dissolve itself as well. Yes, okay. But so would any distinct non-Jewish identity. Oh, okay, so all identities are supposed to disappear? You're not supposed to have any identities? No identities, then how can we be human? Can't be human without an identity. Identity and human are like... The concept of assimilation would lose its sense because there would be no prefigured alternative identity to which Jews could and be expected to assimilate. Hmm. Okay, that's Marxism. Yeah. This vision may now strike many as problematic or naive, <laughs> to say the least. But it did offer a promise and a perspective that was logically consistent within a given conceptual framework and that many radicals of Jewish origin found plausible and attractive because they didn't want to be Jewish. Uh -huh. Why? Because if you were Jewish, you didn't get anywhere. You were censored. You were ostracized. <clears throat> okay. Even among the Social Democrats, it would seem. Okay. If one substituted evolution for revolution, however, and questioned whether any such radical new beginnings where Jews and non-Jews alike would ever occur, one obviously had to suggest or offer something in its stead. Given that their emancipation, even where it had made substantial progress, was still incomplete and contested, contested, the loss of the ground vision Ah, the loss of the grand vision invariably left Jews in greater conceptual limbo than non-Jews, that is, with respect to assimilation. Consequently, it went without saying that the revisionists had to strike a new balance in their evaluation of the relationship between emancipation and assimilation. It took no unusual sensitivity or prescience to acknowledge this necessity. Given the prominence of the Jewish question in public discourse and the centrality of the Jew for non-Jewish identity formation, it would have taken a miracle for the revisionists to be oblivious to this particular implication of their ideological project. The rather more interesting question is this, to what extent did this shift in emphasis genuinely transform or challenge the underlying terms of reference? After all, the revisionists rarely bothered to question, let alone, let alone did they openly negate the merits or desirability of the original Marxian project. For the most part, they simply historicized it. The world was no longer the same as it had been when Marx and Engels formulated their predictions and prescriptions, they argued, and socialists had to adapt their strategies accordingly. It is against this backdrop that we need to assess what exactly the revisionist or gradualist shift in emphasis regarding the Jewish question did and did not challenge. The revisionist position clearly implied a denial of the suggestion that the disappearance of Jewry as a distinct entity would transpire in the way in which Marx had foreseen it. 
It did not, however, automatically question the assumption that the disappearance of Jewry as a distinct entity would eventually occur, nor that this was desirable in the interest of society at large. This will take um, a little drink here. It certainly is true that the revisionist project implied greater leniency towards Jewish self-defense and self-organization. Yeah, man, the Jewish Bund was out there doing the work in the streets, you know. But that is only half the story for this, in turn, rendered all the more important the need to define the necessary limits of that leniency and reassert the underlying assimilationist consensus communis. Yes, well, that was in Germany. And Germany did not work. In this sense, the revisionist shift in emphasis by no means necessarily challenged the generally accepted terms of reference, and in fact, led to their active reaffirmation. Consequently, we need to approach expressions of this greater leniency as we would the proverbial glass of which we need to determine whether it is half full or half empty. Yeah, half full of anti-Semitism is too full. After all, the acknowledgement that under the given circumstances, one realistically had a little choice, but to concede some right to limited forms of Jewish self-defense and self-organization, just as long as they adhered to a whole catalog of caveats, barely amounted to an affirmation of a jury's right to exist indefinitely as a distinct entity. Oh, barely recognized. No, a nice way to be recognized. Yeah. Okay. Rather than attributing the evolution of Bernstein's position to a particular sensitivity, most likely born of his own Jewish origin, a more plausible interpretation would be this. Bernstein took his responsibility as the conceptual father of, of revisionism seriously. Hmm. Oh, a serious fool. Okay. The revisionist project necessitated a more flexible approach to Jewish self-defense and self-organization. Consequently, it also had to take responsibility for the shift by ensuring that it did not go too far. It made sense to address the requisite warnings, not to throw the child out with the bathwater, both to his fellow socialists and to the more credible forces within organized Jewry. As we saw, Bernstein had argued in 1893 that anti-Semitism needed to be criticized above all because it might provoke the Jews into maintaining or reaffirming their distinct identity. Oh, so that's the trouble with anti-Semitism. I didn't know. No. It makes Jews Jewish or Jewishness or it creates Jewishness or what? All that from anti-Semitism. Okay. If one no longer assumed that the inevitable course of historical development would soon sweep away anti-Semitism and Jewry alike, this obviously became a far less transient and consequently all the more important problem. With anti-Semitism on the rise and no comprehensive solution in the wings, the likely result was a massive inflation of increasingly established Jewish separatism. Against this backdrop, that is Zionism. Against this backdrop of Zionism, the Jews both needed and deserved to be told where the boundary between legitimate and illegitimate forms of Jewish self-defense and self-organization lay. Yeah, for sure. I would suggest that this is the main motivation at the root of Bernstein's increasing engagement of the Zionist labor movement. At the same time, we should recall that one of the general planks of Bernstein's revisionist challenge was in any case the suggestion that social democracy needed to engage society far more widely than it habitually did. 
Rather than merely relying on its natural allies, it needed to be considerably more imaginative in seeking out strategic allies. If the working class really was a true representative of the interests of humanity as a whole, it needed to be far more circumspect and open-minded in its response to the legitimate aspirations of those who did not themselves belong to the working class. Why should Bernstein have excluded what were, to his mind, the more credible forces within organized Jewry from this wider horizon that he felt social democracy needed to engage? It would have required a particular anti-Jewish animus to exclude them in this context, but their inclusion does not therefore automatically vouch for particular pro-Jewish sympathies. K-179. Oh, that's enough. That's enough. Can't take too much of this nonsense. Fatigasi <sighs> Connery. Okay, that's enough for now. See you next week.